And welcome once again to another presentation of the Humanities 231 class. I'm your instructor, Professor Barry Graham. We now look at Chapter 4 of your textbook, Culture and Values, 8th edition. This one concerns the Roman legacy. This is a fascinating period of history, which has not a few things in common with our own. During this time, the Roman Empire encompassed all of the known world. Like our freeway systems today, it had an extensive road network. That road network was not exceeded until modern times in the 1950s and 1960s with our freeway system that we enjoy today. Not only did this road of networks extend everywhere in the Roman Empire, but there was an inn every 12 to 20 miles. You'll recall the story of the Good Samaritan, perhaps in Scripture, where upon finding this hurt man, he took him to a nearby inn. This made traveling so much more safe because there was a place to stop, rest, get refreshments, and continue on your journey. This was a 62,000 mile system of roads, really unheard of in ancient times. There was a common language, the Koine Greek. It's no wonder that in our own New Testament scriptures that it's called the fullness of time when Jesus comes into this world. This was during the Roman Empire. There was also what's known as the Pax Romana, a 200-year period of peace unheard of in ancient times and even unheard of even today. During this period, there were no major wars so complete was the control of the Roman Empire during this time. This made it very easy for a message to spread until more recent times when we've had electronic communication, not only with TV and radio, but today with computers. This was an ideal time for a message to spread all over the known world. Just as we have computers and internet they had these roads that could be traveled very easily. A message could be communicated because there was a common language. And so for the gospel, for the good news to come into the world at this time was indeed the fullness of time. The importance of the Roman Empire cannot be overstated. The cultural achievements were many. The Romans were very good at assimilating things. They were very good copiers, if you will. They copied much of what they saw in the previous empire, which of course was the Greek Empire or the Hellenistic Empire. This was part of the Roman genius. They knew who to copy. They didn't have much original to contribute, but they were very, very efficient. Some of their greatest achievements were roads, sewers, aqueducts, but surprisingly in the role of music, they had no serious contributions. One of their interesting inventions, though, was they did invent the tuba. The way that we divide the periods of Roman history are the monarchy and the Etruscan age, Republican Rome, and finally Imperial Rome, which would include the rule of the great Caesars. The Etruscan people are very interesting. It's only in more recent years, due to archaeological discoveries, that we know much about the Etruscans. But as in many ancient cultures, we know the most about them because of their art. We do know that Rome was founded in the mid-8th century B.C. by the Latins. The Etruscans gained control by a, somewhere around 616 B.C.E. The Etruscans were advanced. They had urban or city centers, very good at engineering. They had much in the way of social and leisure activities, a certain amount of free time, which of course makes possible art in any culture. And they were very active, like the Greeks, in trade, and this led to the expansion of their peoples and exposure to other people. In Etruscan art, we see a primitive but paradoxically sophisticated type of art with a focus on the natural. They valued emotion over intellectual appeal. 
As a side note, it's interesting to note that they invented chariot racing and the toga, things that we normally associate primarily with the Roman Empire. When we talk about the founding of the Roman Empire, it would be incomplete if we didn't mention Romulus and Remus. These two figures were actually added, as we see here at the bottom, nursing from the she-wolf in the Renaissance. So this was added years later. But the she-wolf actually goes back to ancient Etruscan times, one of the rare art objects that we have. It's called the Capulatine she-wolf, probably somewhere around 500 to 480 BCE. We think it was probably made by the Etruscans because it fits that time period very well. The reason why Romulus and Remus, the twin boys, are nursing from the she-wolf is this has to do with Roman legend. These two infants were supposedly abandoned or orphaned in their youth, and this kind she-wolf took them in, nursed them, and raised them as her very own. And this makes up a great part of early Roman history as far as giving the Romans an identity. We find the stories of Romulus and Remus primarily in the stories of Virgil. Virgil had the same role among the Romans as Homer did among the Greeks. As far as their artwork, we see this emphasis on the natural here, the striding movement of the statue with the legs, the arms of which very little remain. And then notice once again the coy smile that we saw here in earlier Greek works called the Archaic Smile. This is supposed to depict Apollo of Vi, probably made somewhere around 510 BCE. Notice at his feet the lyre, which of course Apollo was said to have played, being the god of music and the god of intellect that we find among the ancient Romans.
Frescoes or wall paintings were also popular among the Romans as they were among other people of ancient times. Here's a wall painting from the tomb of hunting and fishing. Again, notice this emphasis on the natural with the birds flying. Here's a, a genre scene of the fishermen and things of this nature. And then the porpoise over here, which is very interesting. The next period we'll enter into will be Republican Rome. The Etruscans were expelled from these areas and conquered somewhere around 510 BCE. And this brought in a new government composed of consuls, a senate, and the patricians and the publians. When we talk about the patricians, we're talking about more of the aristocratic families or the ruling class, and the plebeians were more the poor class. So there's an attempt to represent all peoples equally. Of course, as we mentioned with the Greeks, we must keep in mind that we're only talking about free male citizens. Women, slaves, children, they don't have any rights. But we do see a certain amount of political equality and an attempt at a balance of power. And that brings us to Hortesian law. The Publians had an assembly with decisions binding on the entire Roman people. And so this was rather revolutionary to give this much power to common people. By the way, you may notice this term today, Publians, in modern day college fraternities. Many times a new member of that fraternity is called a plebe, and that's where we would get that even today. We notice increasing power and expansion among the Roman Empire and a certain amount of social and political unrest that leads to civil war. The battles between Caesar, Pompey, and Crassus led to this, and this is where we eventually see the rise of the Caesars emerging out of this political and social chaos. We do have a few things still standing today in Rome from ancient times. This is a modern day picture of the Roman Forum. This is where people would gather to discuss these things, including the political leaders of the day. Remember that life during this time, as we mentioned in Greek society as well, was primarily out of doors. We also see the Temple of Vista in the bottom left corner, what remains of it, and the right, the Temple of Concord. We can also see the very famous Arch of Titus in the distance. Whenever the Romans would conquer a people, they would always put an arch there as a reminder of the yoke of their oppression and dominance of those people. It was a way of reminding them that you're conquered, we won, and they would many times carve relief work on these arches to commemorate the, their victories in battle. It's interesting that we have remnants of that even in New Testament Scripture. If you'll check out 2 Corinthians 2.14 in the New International Version, it says, But thanks be to God, who always leads us in triumphal procession in Christ, and through us spreads everywhere the fragrance of the knowledge of him. That's a direct reference to what the Romans would do when they would conquer a people. Not only would they build these arches, but through the middle here they would march in chains the people that they had conquered. In other words, leading them in procession. And so the image here in 2 Corinthians 2.14 that the Apostle Paul talks about is the idea that Jesus has conquered sin, conquered Satan, and he leads them in triumphant procession, and we as his followers march in triumph right along with him as the soldiers and the Roman people would do when they would lead the conquered people through the arch. And so there's a direct reference to that that you would miss in Scripture if you didn't know this important aspect of Roman culture. There were, of course, a number of literary developments during this Republican period of Rome. A writer by the name of Aeneas wrote a couple of very important works called the Annals, and also a certain amount of tragedies adapted from Greek models. You'll remember that we commented that the Romans were great copiers. They copied the Greeks, including their practice of writing plays and presenting them, and that being one of the best ways to transmit a message into that culture. 
Aeneas is considered the father of Roman poetry, and in his work The Annals, he portrays the history of Rome, Romulus and Remus, and many of those things that we talked about earlier when we made reference to Virgil. Another of the great writers was Plautus, and also Terence. They presented Roman adaptations of Greek comedies. And finally, Catullus, he wrote Roman lyric poetry. You'll recall that's poetry that's sung or spoken over the playing of the lyre, and they also did this in the Olympic Games in competitions. He was, of course, greatly influenced by the Greek lyric poetry of Sappho. Other literary developments during the Republic included the very famous Julius Caesar. You'll recall that the month of July in our own calendar is named after Julius Caesar. Caesar was not just a ruler. He was a great writer as well. His commentaries were very significant. And you'll recall, if you've read and studied William Shakespeare's play, Julius Caesar, that he was assassinated on the Ides of March, in other words, March 15th, 44 BCE. If you think back on that play, there are many of the details that surround that particular and very significant event. And William Shakespeare, years later in the Renaissance, is still writing on these things. We also want to note Marcus Tullius Cicero, perhaps the most well-known orator during that time. He was also a lawyer, and he left a great deal in the way of epistolary legacy. This was during the late period of the Republic as well. We now want to move to Roman philosophy and law. Epicureanism was a very dominant philosophy during this time. It was founded by Epicurus, who lived from 341 to 271 BCE, and it was extolled or supported by Lucretius in the years that you see here. Very much an intellectual philosophy, intellectual and rational, and it argued against a self-indulgent attitude. One of the best works was Lucretius' work called On the Nature of Things. They held that the gods played no part in human affairs. They held that you should certainly seek pleasure, but only pleasure in moderation. Pleasure and calm composure should be the thing that are most sought after by human beings. Now we'll note later that there's an interesting account in the New Testament with the Apostle Paul in Acts the 17th chapter where Paul actually encounters these Epicurean philosophers along with the Stoics. If you look at Acts 17 there's a verse where Paul directly addresses the Epicureans and you wouldn't know that unless you knew something about Epicurean philosophy. Note this verse the God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything, because he himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. And so that's a direct reference to the Epicurean philosophy and how he's countering that with the Christian message. I think if you look at this verse, You'll see some things jump out that are directly related to Epicurean philosophy and how Paul is countering that with Christian belief and Christian teaching. We just mentioned the Stoics, or Stoicism. They held that the world was governed by divine reason and that there was a role of divine providence in all of this. There were a number of great Roman Stoics, Seneca, Epictetus, and even one of the Roman emperors, uh, Marcus Aurelius, they held to the concept of the Lagos. Now, that word may not mean a lot to you, but once again, there's scripture that's a direct reference to this. They held that the Lagos was the divine intelligence that created and held everything together. The Apostle John, in John 1.1, 1, 1, says, In the beginning was the Word. And eventually he says the Word was with God and the Word was God and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. You may have always had a curiosity about that. Why does John refer to Jesus as the Word? Well, this is the reason why. It has to do directly 
with Roman and Greek philosophy regarding the Lagos. John is very plainly telling the people there that what you understand as this divine reason or this divine intelligence that created everything and holds everything together is actually Jesus. Jesus fulfills all of that. And so there's a direct reference there to identifying Jesus as God in the flesh. And this is very important because you may run into people sometimes that say, well, you know, in the Bible, Jesus never really claims to be God. Well, that's actually not true. If you look in John the 8th chapter, Jesus directly says, before Abraham was, I am. He's using a term there that Jews only use to refer to God, that phrase, I am. So Jesus definitely did claim to be God by using what the Jews called the tetragrammaton. Google that term sometimes and you'll find it very, very interesting. So not only does Jesus claim to be God, his followers who walked with him and had a direct relationship with him also claimed that he was God, the second person of the Trinity. And that's why John says, in the beginning was the word. The Greek word there is actually logos. In the beginning was the logos. Once again, if you go to Acts 17, there's a verse there where Paul makes direct reference to this in his teaching as he addresses both the Stoics and the Epicureans. In verse 30 of that chapter, it says, In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all men everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof to this to all men by raising him from the dead. That's a direct reference there to Stoic philosophy. And if you'll do some examination on that, I think you'll find that certain parts of that verse will jump out at you. Continuing with Roman philosophy and law, in Julius Caesar's Il Seville, this is a single unified code of civil law. We're beginning to see a modern concept of law evolve out of this. Also, the law of the Twelve Tablets. We also see Justinian's Corpus Juris Civilis. The Roman science of law begins to grow out of this, and there are legal experts, people who we today would call lawyers, and even a system of natural justice. It's important for us to remember that one of the few original Roman contributions that we see historically is a concept of law. So as we said earlier, even though the Romans didn't do much in the way of original things, this was an exception to that. We'll then proceed to Republican art and architecture. What contributions might the Romans have made here during this Republican period of government? Well, one of the things was the Roman portraiture. We see some beautiful examples of this. Realistic details. They tend to express outer appearance and inner characteristics. It tends to be propagandistic. In other words, it's making the ruler look very, very good in order to communicate a certain image to the people, which is what politicians, generally speaking, are prone to do anyway. This was pioneered by the earlier Etruscan people, and it tended to be a psychological expression of these individuals. Architecture, as well, was used as a political medium. These great public buildings were built to exemplify the glory of the leaders. And that's why these styles of buildings, even today, are used in our own governmental buildings and even banks sometimes to express stability. And this is a place that you can feel safe investing your money. A good example of that is this bust of Cicero, the great Roman lawyer that we referred to earlier. And notice how thoughtful and preoccupied he looks here. Cicero is portrayed in a way that's very flattering to him. Our look at Imperial Rome begins in the year 31 BCE. Immediately before this time, as we referred to earlier, Caesar is assassinated in 44 BCE on the Ides of March, as in the William Shakespeare account of it. 
We also have the Battle of Actium, which occurs in this important year of 31 BCE. This is when Octavian fights Mark Antony in an inter-Roman battle. You'll remember Mark Antony as the famous lover of Cleopatra. Cleopatra, of course, being one of the Greek Seleucid rulers there in Egypt. Octavian then is inaugurated as Augustus in 27 BCE. You'll note that Augustus actually has two months of the year named after him. He is so significant. October in Octavian, as we've noticed, and August in Augustus. We're seeing here that the emperors of the Roman Empire are now being considered as gods. Augustus literally means the revered one. And this will lead to the eventual cult of the emperor worship in the Roman Empire. This was very much in place in the beginnings of Christianity. And surprisingly, early Christians were not persecuted because they worshipped Jesus Christ. They were persecuted because they wouldn't recognize the Roman emperor as a god. The emperor referred to himself as Jesus did, as the Son of God, and news about how the emperor was going to set everything right was actually called gospel, or good news. And so when Christians would refer to Jesus as the Son of God and to his message as the good news, this was considered as political insurrection. Augustus ruled over a vast multi-ethnic empire, the largest one in the world up to this point. As emperor, he established a government bureaucracy, a, a civil service, similar to the types of things we would think about today with police departments and fire departments and civil organizations, as well as vast engineering projects and bridges, and we'll have more to say about that later. Also, the Roman army was one of the most powerful armies that existed in ancient times. They had a mobile strike force whereby their ground troops could cover many miles within a given day with a full pack of supplies and weapons. It said that they could cover somewhere around 24 miles in one day, which on foot back then was incredibly fast. During this Augustan period, we see literature. We've mentioned Virgil to you before. He was the Roman equivalent of the Greek Homer, and Roman art tended to promote the Augustan worldview. Most art is propagandistic. It's said to promote the ruler in a positive way in those days, and so it served official public state purposes. Virgil's most popular work was the Aeneid. This went back in Roman history and continued to underscore the tales of Romulus and Remus. It was a tribute to Rome and Augustus. It became the national epic of Rome. It stressed themes like human destiny and personal responsibility. Some of the other works were the Ecologues or the Bucolics and the Georgics. We can see these themes show up in works such as this. This is a very small part of a very large fresco or mural of the day. It was the gardenscape of the Villa Livia. You can still see it in Italy today. And you can note the naturalistic themes with the trees and the birds. One of the most amazing things was that at this point in history, they were beginning to use things like atmospheric perspective and linear perspective in the paintings. This is much earlier than previously was thought to have these types of qualities. You can see the mountains here in the background. They seem to get smaller as they recede into the landscape. And also, as we mentioned, the atmospheric perspective in that things tend to blur as they go off in the distance. And so this was very, very advanced for the day. Augustine's sculpture was no less impressive. We see it in things like the Ara Pacis, the characteristics of Virgil poetry exist here. It contains both a political and a social message. It was dedicated to the spirit of peace, peace with a capital P, and celebrates the abundance of nature. We see it also in works like Augustus of the Prima Portia. It celebrates his victory over the Parthians and underscores this idea of national pride in the Romans and Roman culture. 
This is a picture of the aria pacus. We've made reference to that already, but this really underscores what we're talking about here. By the way, the aria pacus means the altar of Augustan peace. It's made of marble. It's a rectangular stone wall. It's very large, has a big central doorway, and you can still see the altar just barely visible, flanked by the reliefs showing Romulus and Remus. Hard to see in this picture, but there are other pictures, no doubt, that you can Google to get more detail on something like this. Here is the aforementioned Augustus of Prima Portia, and you see how important it is to depict the ruler in a positive light. They're almost always depicted as soldiers. You can see him pointing forward, leading the people of Rome on to victory, the serene look on his face. Here at the bottom we see Cupid, one of the Cupids, the symbol of love, as if to say, the emperor loves you. It was the good news, the gospel of Augustus. He's the one who has come to set all things right. One of the most interesting historical events of this time was the destruction of Pompeii. This happened because of the eruption of a volcano, Mount Vesuvius, August 24th in 79 CE, or AD, as we sometimes refer to it. The reason why we have quite a bit written information on this was because of a governmental official and historian, Pliny the Younger, what is really fascinating about this event is because the eruption happened so quickly that it virtually froze this culture in time. Everything was preserved, and so we get to see a typical Roman colony, and it gives us great insight into ordinary Roman or Pompeian life. The buildings are preserved, the domestic ornaments, even the food in many cases, is still preserved in the jars and the vases of the day. Fascinating insight into Roman culture. The architecture of Rome, also very, very impressive during this day. There were triumphal arches, as we've already made mention of, internal arches and vaults. This shows the great versatility of the arch in that, depending upon the way it's configured, it can make an arch, a vault, or even a dome. The barrel vault is made when it's put in 90 degree angles. A dome occurs when we have a hemispherical vault. As we've mentioned in the past, the domes still tend to be very popular today in our sports arenas. Emperor Hadrian commissioned the Pantheon and the Imperial Flora. Again, this contains a dome and an oculus, or an eye to the heavens. This is a hole in the roof. I know in Texas Stadium, and again AT&T Stadium, where the Dallas Cowboys play, we still have that concept where there's a hole in the roof, or the roof can be opened, and so this concept stays with us in modern structures. Great engineering achievements. The aqueducts, such as the Pont de Garde, still around today. Many of these bridges and aqueducts are still around to this very day. And covered sewers. We take this for granted, but if you go back even a couple of hundred years ago in European countries, they did not have covered sewers. This made for a great stench, but they had them in ancient Rome, way ahead of their time. Wanted to show you a few depictions of the triumphal arch, the barrel vault that we made mention of. And over here in the very famous Roman Colosseum, you see the use of the arch to support great amounts of weight. By the way, the Romans didn't invent concrete, but they certainly perfected the technique of using it. This portion of the Colosseum is still in the city of Rome today. And this was, of course, where they held some of the many gladiatorial contests that you see in movies such as, well, not surprisingly, Gladiator. There's a great reconstruction of the Roman Colosseum in that movie. It's well worth your time to check that out. We've mentioned the dome. Here we are again that if arches are placed side by side, 
you can make a solid dome out of them. This practice continues up to this very day. We now want to move to Rome as the object of satire. This may surprise you, this empire was so majestic, but any empire begins to decline after some period of time. Overpopulation, overcrowding was one of the reason. Very humble private residences. So there was a writer by the name of Juvenal, lived from 60 to 130 CE or AD, and he wrote many satirical poems. There was a biting sarcasm to them, and he didn't have a very high view of women. We call this misogyny to this very day. That, of course, brings us to the end of the Roman Empire. It didn't happen all at once. There was a gradual decline and political disunity. There was an insufficient army to support the country, so they began using mercenary troops. Mercenary means paid soldiers. This resulted in increased taxes and a decreased value of money. We call this inflation and an impossibility of trade because of these types of events. The latter Roman emperors, emperors like Diocletian, Emperor Constantine, who was one of the ones who legalized Christianity in 313, AD and eventually brought together some of the early Christian councils to make decisions on matters of theology and Christian practice and then of course the deposition of Romulus Augustulus. In 476 AD we see the virtual fall of the Western Empire. The Eastern Empire continues and it divided around this point and so we do see a big decline in the West with the invasion of the Vandals and the Savages and the Goths and the Visigoths and all of those original Latin terms. In late Roman art and architecture, we see the last great Roman imperial buildings. Two of them we want to mention are the Basilica or the Palace of Constantine and the Palace of Diocletian. By the way, Diocletian was the last of the Roman emperors to persecute the Christians. Many people feel that some of the prophecies in the book of Revelation in the New Testament refer to Diocletian, though of course that's constantly under debate. During this time there was an abandonment of classical ideals, a lack of perspective and precision, an enthusiasm for Eastern religious cults, surprisingly enough, and then the rise of the importance of Christianity. Christianity and these Eastern religious cults had a great rivalry for quite a while. Religions such as the Gnostics and the Docetics, who differed and varied very greatly from Christian belief. They were labeled heretics by the early church fathers. Much of the writings of these early church fathers, church leaders, dealt with these heresies. We want to show you a couple of depictions now of the Basilica of Constantine, still standing even to this day. Once again, you can see the use of the arches that is used to support these great amounts of weight. Here, on the other hand, is an artist's rendition of this great palace of Diocletian. You can see this is quite a residence right off the waterway with the, you can see the ships and must have been an absolutely magnificent structure. Here's what's left of it today. You can see the modern day tourists and should you ever have the opportunity to travel to Italy, you can see it yourself. And this will conclude our presentation for chapter four.